All right, well, it looks like the uh, number of participants is stabilized at, at 46. So I'm going to call a meeting of the 911 Advisory Board uh, into session. And the first item on the agenda is a roll call. So uh, CHP Chief Chris Childs. Present. Good morning, sir. Brenda Brunner. Present. Good morning. Leanne Magoski. Present. Rosa Ramos. Present. Sheriff Ingrid Braun. Sheriff Bill Ayub. Here. Good morning, sir. Juan Carlos Castillo. Present. Good morning, sir. Chief Rebecca Ramirez. Present. Chief Elise Warren. Here. Good morning. And Chief Andrew White. President. Good morning. Good morning, all. Um, well, welcome to the uh, to the August uh, 9 woman advisory board meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, the next and Paul or somebody, can you bring up the slide presentation so we can go through the, the agenda? We'll we'll bring that up in, in just a second, Pat, because um, I've got it set up for a closed session right now. Okay. Um, well, we do the first item. Uh, item number two on the agenda is approval of the previous minutes from May of 2021. Are there any corrections? Hearing no corrections, we'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. I'm sorry. Okay. Who was that? By Brenner Brown. And a second. Leanne will second. Thank you. Second by Leanne. Okay. A roll call vote. Chief Childs. Chief Childs, are you Not available? Eleven. There's always a mute button. Sorry, everybody, I'm here. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, voting on approval of the minutes from uh, from me. I vote move to approve. Okay, approve. Um, Brenda Brunner. Aye. Uh, Leanne Magoski. Aye. Rosa Ramos. Aye. Uh, Sheriff uh, Ingrid Braun, have you joined us? No, Sheriff. Sheriff Ayub. Ayub. Hi. Uh, Juan Carlos Castillo, you cannot do it. Uh, Chief Elise Warren. Aye. And Chief Andrew White. Aye. Okay, and for, uh, before we move on, um, the I, I would like to welcome our new board members um, in Juan Carlos Castillo and Chief Rebecca Ramirez. Um, I also believe uh, Chief Andrew White was formally appointed by the governor's office. And, uh, or was that, I'm sorry, is that that's, Chief that's, Warren or Chief White? Uh, White, that's correct. Okay. And then uh, Sheriff Ingrid Braun uh, is, was approved also for a second term. So welcome to all of those. Um, you know, I would like to uh, to recognize Chris Heron for all of his uh, his hard work. You know, on the uh, on the advisory board as well as you know in the um, um, the Long Range Planning Committee, and also to uh, our former chief. I just lost his name from uh, San Diego area. Uh, you know, who was a representative from from the fire, uh, Chief Hatfield. So Hatfield. Yeah, so thank you to both uh, both Chief Hatfield and to and to Chris Heron. We really do appreciate the um, your your effort. Uh, the next item agenda on the agenda is um, a closed session. So for those board members, you've been sent a separate invitation, and we will be um, stepping away from this meeting and, and rejoining at the end of the closed session. For any 911 advisory board member sent the Microsoft Teams link, please log out of the Zoom meeting for the closed session and then log into the Teams link. Thank you.
we'll give the board members another moment to uh, to come back and then we'll have to call roll again one more time. Okay, I'm going to call roll uh, one more time to, to confirm that we do have a quorum. Uh, Chief uh, Chris Childs? Present. Brenda Brunner? Present. Liam Magoski? Present. Rosa Ramos? Present. Sheriff Braun is on vacation. Sheriff Bill Ayub? Present. Juan Carlos Castillo? Present. Chief Rebecca Ramirez? Present. Chief Elise Warren? Present. And Chief Andrew White? Present. Okay, we have a quorum again, Budge. Um, uh, as far as the, the closed session, it was held pursuant to government code section 11126E, uh, and we have nothing to report out. Okay, on to the legislative update. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Salvador is, uh, is uh, busy fighting fires. Um, so we're going to have Chris Hacker from his office. Um, I'll provide the update. Chris, are you with us? I am here. Unfortunately, yeah, you guys get me. Uh, but here I am. Happy to be here. Thank you. Chris Hacker from the Cal OES Office of Legislative and External Affairs. Uh, we are tracking a number of pieces of legislation that relate to the 911 system getting to the end of session. Uh, so we expect things to get nutty here pretty soon. But here's where we're at. So AB 988 is in the uh, Senate. It was referred to a couple policy committees, uh, Senate GO and Senate Health, and uh, we're waiting a hearing date potentially. There isn't one set yet on that one. AB 1100 is in the Senate in appropriations on the suspense file currently. Chris, what, what is that piece of legislation regarding? Okay, uh, so uh, AB 988, mental health, this is the crisis mobile support teams and the 988 crisis hotline. Um, AB 1100 is related to uh, infrastructure that's destroyed during disasters and telecommunications providers reporting information on rebuilding that infrastructure. AB 1403, that's the bill that would include a de-energization de event as uh, constituting a state of emergency. And that bill is in, uh, in, back in the Senate and it's ordered to its second reading. Uh, AB 1565 would authorize Cal OES to investigate the feasibility of establishing more than one toll-free 800 hotline. Uh, that is in the Senate uh, Governmental Organization and Appropriations. SB 52, which would also include de-energization events as a uh, constituting an emergency and would also de define de-energization events. Uh, SB 341 would make requirements of telecommunication service providers to maintain information on its website of outage maps um, and would also require PUC and Cal OES to create rules and regulations regarding uh, those maps. And that bill is in the Committee on Appropriations in the Assembly. Uh, on the federal side of things, uh, we're monitoring H.R. 1250 Emergency Reporting Act. That is in the Senate and it's currently in the Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. HR 1848 would, would make a number of investments in infrastructure, including next gen 911, and that is still in the House. HR 1859, which would uh, work with some programs on uh, response programs, that is in the House as well. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 466 is currently in the House, it's in the other chamber, and that has to do with uh, mobile or internet voice service providers disclosing location information pursuant to certain requests. Uh, Senate, uh, Senate Bill 1175 categorized public safety telecommunicators as a protective service occupation. Um, that is in the Senate, and it is still in Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. That concludes my briefing and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, board members have any questions of Mr. Hacker? Hearing none, we'll move on to item number five, which is the Cal OES uh, 911 branch update. Budge, floor is yours. 
All right, thank you. Um, the, as you see, there's a, a six standing items that we typically brief out on. And uh, if you have any questions as I'm moving through these items, please feel free to just interrupt me um, and I'll answer the question right then. It'll probably be, be a lot easier because we'll, we'll put it in context that way. So the first slide we, we uh, talk about is our call stats. And this is a summary of 2020. 2020. Um, we will again, obviously, at the end of this year, produce the stats. What we're seeing is an upward trend here. Each year, wireless is growing one or two percentage points over the rest. Um, and usually, there, we see a decline in wireline. That's been the general trend. And then the other interesting metric is the text to 911. Last year, we had a little over 50% of our PSAPs were active. Now we have 100% uh, minus one, one PSAP. Uh, taking text and I one, so it'll be interesting to see what happens to those statistics in 2021. Our call processing equipment, CPE, this is a status of our installation. You see we historically do about 60 systems a year, and you're probably wondering, okay, um, doing quick math, it's August, we should be way over 11. Uh, why are we at 11? And the challenge we're having now is that the call processing equipment was required to be NINA I3 compliant. It's a standard on how they have to deliver uh, calls in the next gen 911 network. And the call processing equipment vendors um, are having some challenges there that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So what we're doing is if you have as a PSAP older CPE, reach out to your PSAP advisor. Every PSAP has a, has a dedicated advisor. If you're not sure who that advisor is, then, then please reach out to us um, at Cal OES and we'll, we'll let you know who that person is. And uh, we could talk to you about maintenance. And if you're in a condition now where your CPE is not performing or you're concerned that it's gonna fail or have a catastrophic outage, let us know. We do have the ability to, you know, on a case by case basis, see what we can do to shore that up. But in general, the problem has been that the, the call processing equipment is not compliant with the contract. So based on state procurement rules, we can't buy something that we know is out of compliance. It's a different story for everything that's already installed. So these bullets on this slide are kind of high level of where the problems are. Um, our entire network is, is IP version six. Um, most of the, the, well, all of the CPE as it's installed today um, is IP version four and typically does not have a unique IP address. They use private addressing space, which means that you can't use it in a larger network. Um, you, you need a, pub, uh, a public IP address for that. And then the transport layer security information that's needed to be exchanged across the network is not supported. So the unique IP address that I mentioned there, that ends up uh, being very critical in the NINA I3 call flow because you can't, um, answer back to a specific location because it's not uniquely identified. The next bullet there, element state, Q state, that has to do with whether a dispatcher is or a call taker is, is on the phone, whether they're, um, the phone is ringing and not being answered or whether it's busy or it, it returns all those values. And there's a certain way that you're supposed to do that in the I3 standard and the call processing equipment can't do that. So it returns error codes and we know how to interpret those error codes, um, but it really should be, you know, communicating back using um, I3 messaging and it's not. Uh, Real-time text, um, we've probably all heard of that buzzword. Um, that's the ability to support um, rather than just standard SMS texting like you do today, but it can support uh, photos and videos and, you know, other capabilities. Um, the, the CPE does not do that. And there's this how you transfer a call um, using conferencing versus a method called refer. Um, refer is the way it, it really should be done in the I3 standard. So there's that gap. So what we've done, and we've talked about this in, in this advisory board many times, is uh, we've asked our next gen 911 vendors to put as many workarounds as they can in place to shore up these gaps. And that's what we've been doing. We also are now to the point where we can actually test not only in our lab, which we, you know, we've been doing extensive testing in our lab, but actually at the PSAP, the ability to answer a 911 call and have the location information displayed properly for the telecommunicator 
and also then push downstream into computer-aided dispatch and, and other um, downstream um, products that you're using to make sure that it follows the same format as today. And we're finding some gaps there. So until we get our CPE to the point that it can address all of this, we can't buy new CPE unless there's some dire circumstance that we're trying to um, accommodate. And that's where you, you'd reach out to us and, and we can work with you. So I want to pause there for a minute to see if there's any questions, because this is a pretty, a pretty important point. I want to make sure everybody uh, understands what's going on. So any questions from the board members? Um, Brenda Bruner, I have a question about the, the inability to support the real time text. Um, there's an understanding there was a timeline that PSAPs were supposed to be able to um, support real time text. Is that something that's also being taken in consideration with the build out of um, being able to present those calls to the PSAP in meeting yeah. the timeline? Yeah, thanks for the question, Brenda. So it's really there's there's three parts of the system you have to think about for real time text. First, the carrier has to be able to send you real time text messages, which means they have to connect to you IP. Um, it has to be an IP connection. It cannot be a, an analog or a camera or SS7 or one of the older technologies. Right now in the legacy 911 system, there is no ability to ingress IP calls. So you absolutely have to have next gen 911. We're solving that with the build out of next gen 911. We can receive real time text in next gen 911, route real time text, and deliver real time text to the PSAP. So the middle piece will be addressed by next gen 911 and the carrier's ability to deliver IP. Most of them have told us they're ready, but until we can receive it, there, there's no sense in sending it. Um, and the next, the final step is once I have it in next gen 911 or the system has a next gen 911, we've got to be able to display it once it gets to the PSAP and without upgrading the call processing equipment, we can't display it. So it's, all three of those things have to be in place in order to do this. And until we get next gen deployed, you know, we can't support it. And then we'll start working with the carriers, but we still have the gap of the call processing equipment. Um, so that's where we are in the interim to meet this requirement. The carriers are converting it over to TTY, uh, which is a, um, another um, protocol that's analog based. And then we push TTY through the network and deliver it to the PSAP and the PSAP can display the TTY message. So we're able to meet the requirement using TTY, even though we all know it's not the preferred method and, and not what we ultimately want to do. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. So how do we but, fix uh, all, but, yeah, sorry, go ahead. But, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I, I have a, a question uh, on that back on that other slide. So I, I completely respect and understand what we need to do. And yes, that all of that, especially the real-time text and the, the unique IP address is absolutely important. But with those agencies that are in that pickle of on the case-by-case -case basis that are you know waiting, if, if we don't have systems at work, what is the case-by-case -case that, that you're suggesting that they do to keep their legacy equipment running since in some cases they've been waiting for so long, it's it's getting quite um, elderly. <laughs> yeah, no no offense to anything elderly, but yes, we've realized that that is a, that is a problem. Um, we have yet to have a PSAP talk to us that's in such dire condition that we need to um, approve the sale of more legacy equipment, uh, but that's what we would have to do. We would just have to say, okay, you're not getting I3 compliant equipment. We realize that. We'll put the vendor on notice that they've got to get it up to that level once their um, solution is able, and then we would move forward from there. We have not had to do that, but until we get the, the cloud CPE approved through the lab and next gen 911 installed, we really don't have another option. Okay. But I mean, thankfully, I mean, we, we, we're yeah. not there anywhere right now. I want to make that clear. No one has contacted us saying they're at that place. And I don't know if this is farther along in your presentation, but 
I, I think my concern in representing um, the PSEPs is that oh, they keep waiting. And I am concerned that eventually one of those systems is going to fail. Or by the time we get next generation 911 rolled out, there's so many people waiting, they're going to have to stay on their legacy systems for longer because you just can't implement that many systems um, in a short period of time. Yeah. And and we had a meeting with the team this morning. I'll go back a couple of slides. So you see the record here is uh, 92 systems in one year. So we just brought on a new supervisor um, to backfill Andrew's old position in the uh, PSAP advisory unit. Her name is Janae. Uh, and we told her, hey, guess what? You got to beat 92. So you're going to have to roll out about 120 in your first year. No pressure. Welcome aboard. And, and that's literally what we know we're going to have to do to make up the backlog. And it, it is a heavy lift. And we realize that that's coming. So, um, yes, good point, Leanne. We completely agree with you. And, and I really want to make it clear, this is not what we planned. We planned buying equipment from CPE vendors who were compliant with the contract. So we just want to make sure that everybody realizes we, this is not what we wanted to do. So how do we get there um, with that 120 new systems in one year? Uh, really, the, this new cloud-based contract that was signed a year ago, believe it or not. Um, and we're already in the process of testing or, or defining the test requirements and putting the circuits in place to test the systems that are shown in yellow on this screen. So Atos has a product called Gemma. It's a cloud-based CPE. Carbine is a cloud-based CPE product. Lumen uh, resells a product called Omni 911. It's cloud-based. And NGA is a cloud-based solution called ACE CHS, which I can't remember the acronym. I think it's Automated Computing Equipment Call Handling System or something like that. It's, it's an acronym. Um, and so those are the ones that we're starting with first, and we're making it very clear that we want to test with everybody that's on this list. And our goal is to get through the testing process for all of those that are shown in yellow at a minimum by the end of the year. Uh, so we can start to roll those systems out as we roll out next gen 911 throughout the state. Uh, we've got a lab here when these systems are up and running. And uh, if you want to see a demo, we can do that. Um, I would anticipate the first of these will probably get through testing by the end of September if things go fast, uh, but it could go into October before we get the first systems tested through the lab. So any questions on that? Yeah, I had a question. Um, and as far as the timeline on the previous slide, have they given... Um, an estimate on how long to remediate those issues, particularly the ones, um, you know, like the IP addressing issue, some of the things that seem like they're barriers to even get moving? Yeah, so so uh, Chief White, the, the short answer is no, they have not given us a definitive timeline. And I wanna be clear, this, this little part of the uh, definition with equipment installed at the PSAP today is very important because when you reach out to your call processing equipment vendor, they may say, hey, we can do that. Then the very next question should be, can you do that with the equipment I have installed in my back room today? And they're probably gonna say no, because they need a couple of pieces of equipment, a session border controller um, and a software upgrade and some other things. And so, and some of them can't even do it then. So that's the challenge we have. They don't even have a timeline for this, which is why we've suspended sales because if they had a definitive timeline and we could test and validate in our lab, then we would just sell, you know, all we want is I3 compliant equipment. We're, we're, you know, we just want to meet the needs of the PSAP and we're just not there. So moving forward though, on the next slide, then the cloud-based CPEs, I assume those theoretically meet, uh, address those uh, issues. Yes, all of these will address those issues, exactly. So there is a path then moving forward to keep yes. us on track just a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I, I figured that conversation would take a while. It's very important. Um, we're obviously, we, we're spending a lot of time 
um, dedicating resources to this and working with these various vendors. You see the number, the list of companies up there, and you can imagine how complex it is to coordinate all this. Um, and that's what we've really been focusing on. Uh, text to 911, I, I really want to give uh, credit to Sharice Bartlett for her hard work on this effort. Um, just absolutely amazing the work that she's done and really uh, Cindy and Ella and, and, and Gail and others have been instrumental in this process. And then every single piece app and your willingness to meet the state's timelines and uh, work with us to deploy this solution. It, it's just, you know, really appreciate the support and, and congratulations to Sharice on a job well done. This is a, a tremendous, tremendous effort um, that, that she undertook and completed. So we're compliant now, minus one piece app. And the reason why the one is not there, um, their internet connection is not stable enough to support um, the, uh, the text delivery. And so we're just going to integrate it when we go next gen 911. Um, that way we'll solve it um, through that. And it's, uh, if you're wondering, um, it's Sonora PD. So, you know, their call volume is not uh, substantial and they work really closely with Tuolumne County Sheriff. So the, the, the folks that live in Sonora PD are taken care of. There's no, there's no gap there. Um, and we just want to let you know that's the one. So any, any questions on text? Okay. So I'll cover more on text and 911 as we transition in a minute. These next couple of slides, I've been using this graphic to kind of talk about how we've got to install equipment in, in all the PSAPs. We have to integrate the originating service providers or the carriers. We've got to do testing and integration. We got to do, we got to do the transition. So the, these are all steps that are ongoing as we put this next gen 911 um, puzzle together. And one thing you'll notice we've we've updated these dates it seems like every time we have a meeting we have to update the dates and i'm going to talk about why and what our challenges are but realistically you know it'll be december of 2022 before we're completed just because we know it's going to take um, over a year to complete the transition once we start and what's causing the the delays well the challenges of working with cpe and i'll talk about that in a minute obviously covid and, and just us learning how to improve the project, the process. You know, we've, we've been learning a lot as well. Um, it, it turned out that this is a rather large project. Um, we're pretty sure this is the largest 911 system in the US and might be the largest 911 system in the world. And uh, um, it's, it, it's, it's actually quite complicated. Um, so anyway, no excuses, but the dates are changing. So we've used this graphic um, a lot. And, and it still holds true. There's three lanes that we're coordinating. Uh, the first lane is what are the minimum updates that the call processing equipment vendor needs to do to support next gen 911? And this is not, we, we know the gaps. This is what do we need to do even with those gaps addressed by the next gen 911 vendor? They have to install a firewall and program it. There's network connections that need to be made. They've got to do line appearances and program them for your those for your uh, 911 first responders and then they've got to train and, and test those. We have to install all the equipment. That's the middle portion of this graphic for both Atos, which is our statewide vendor and the region provider. There's circuits, there's equipment, there's connections. And then we've got to make sure that all that works and can land calls with those line appearances that were programmed by the CPE vendors. We call that DMARC testing to make sure that the, the connection between the two is there. And then along the bottom, we start working with carriers to land calls. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the successes we've had, but once all that's in place, we do go live testing, the PSEP training is ready, the, the network operations center uh, piece is in place and, and we can start um, going through the, the cutover process. So we have implemented up, so somebody has a question to go back one slide. So um, I don't know how that message came up. I thought we blocked chat, but all right. So yeah, the, the end dates is December, 2022. I, I saw that message flashed. All right. Um, so the validation that we're doing, what we want to do is, is, is make sure that for a period of two weeks, we can land calls on those newly programmed line appearances 
transfer them. Andy Alley is working. Location can pass through the system, can integrate with CAD, validate alternate route processes, all your trainings completed. Trouble tickets can be entered if needed. You've got an interface with the network operations center, and we know we can bring in calls from the carriers. So all this is what we want to do and what we've tried to do um, a number of times. And this is where we started to discover some problems. And I'll, and I'll talk about those for a second. So everything up till now is process related. And I wanna pause here to see if there's any process related questions. Okay. So what have we done? Um, so all the PSAP boundaries are in, which is uh, a huge milestone because the way we're gonna route calls is we'll look at the lat long or the civic address of the caller. We look at the PSAP boundary and if you fall in that boundary, we route the call. So these boundaries are critical. Those are done, vetted, validated. We, we've built four, five different Next Gen 911 NINA I3 compliant NG911 core systems. And they all work one to another. Um, Atos, NGA, Lumen, Synergen. We've tested failover, we've tested circuits. You can literally go in the back room and unplug stuff mid call and the call still goes through. So huge, huge uh, milestones there that, that we vetted and validated. Um, we've done carrier testing with T-Mobile and Verizon Wireless all the way into a PSAP, all the way into the lab here uh, at Cal OES. And we've successfully delivered handsets from a handset out in the field using geospatial routing with a completely NINA I3 compliant architecture all the way into the PSAP. We've done all that. And we've deployed equipment at over 80% of the PSAPs in California. So, um, you know, you're talking... I don't know, whatever 80% of 450 is, that's a big number. Um, and then we've got system monitoring and trouble ticketing that we've got testing. Uh, we think we have a couple more tweaks to do to that, but, but all of this is working today. Um, so huge, huge progress. And we knew that it would take about 24 months to get this done. And guess what? I think tomorrow is the anniversary of when we signed the contracts, um, August 19th. Right. Friday, August 20th. So August 20th will be the two year mark of when we signed contracts. Um, you know, and once you sign contracts, there's always a lag to when you really start work. And so we've really only been actively working on this for a little over 18 months. So we're, we're feeling pretty good about where we are, but we, we you know, we, we do still have some challenges. Um, there's some barriers. One of the main things we're running into is the, uh, the CPE and, and just the I3 functions. And I'll tell you what this looks like. Uh, we do testing, we discover a problem, and we take two to three to four weeks to fix the problem. And that problem is masking the problem that it exists after that step in the process. So it's not like you test and you see all the way down through the landscape and say, oh, here's the 10 problems we have to fix. Let's start addressing them. And the current challenge you're seeing blocks your view of everything else that's not working. And so we've been working our way through taking down these barriers and trying to overcome this. And uh, you can imagine when we run into feedback of, hey, we need to upgrade the software in the CPE. Well, that's 450 software upgrades that we have to go through. So, I mean, it's just, it's not possible to turn on a dime with that kind of schedule. So now we're working with the next gen nine one providers to develop new code and code changes and testing and, and all of that. That's really what has been um, causing a lot of delay is that complication. And then this day two support, which is, um, you know, the ability to call the network operations center and enter a trouble ticket and get a status and all that. Um, we've been working on that. We certainly have been impacted in the supply chain and with resources due to COVID. Um, you know, what typically would be a three to four week turnaround on parts turned into three to four months uh, turnaround. Um, so that, that certainly had an impact. And this is the one that's, that's really causing us the most delay right now, delivery of location information. And we even had to go back to the NINA I3 working group that wrote the standard to make sure we're doing it the right way and to make sure that every 
next gen 911 service providers doing it the right way and that according to the standard and that the CPE vendors are doing it the correct way. And once that information comes into the system, it has to flow to all your downstream systems that you already have at your PSAP without impacting them. And, and so that's the spill to CAD, pushing the location information over to CAD. And that's the barrier we're trying to solve right now. Uh, some of the CPE out there can do it better than others, but there's gaps that exist everywhere. So that's what we're working on now. We obviously don't want to deploy next gen 911 and not be able to give you location information. Or you have location information over in your on your call processing screen screen, but not on your CAD screen. And then this other one, you know, this is a big project. It's um, massive. So uh, I, it's never been attempted before, and it turns out that we're doing a lot of pioneering work in this space. So it's 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 been an interesting process. So I want to see if there's any questions about these barriers and 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 what these delays are. Budget's a lot to take in, so I I, I wish we had we had a little more time than than on this, but so is it it's an when when do we think with with all of this moving forward that that there's you're just going to keep us updated basically right on these things yeah i think it's the next slide uh, okay uh, i just i'm ahead you have a slide on when <laughs> it's about four okay. slides down okay i'll i'll, I'll uh, keep quiet so i think maybe your question too um leanne is how do we overcome these that's what this slide is so um, we're going to be doing testing this week to validate that the fixes that were that are being put in place for call delivery actually work. Um, that's going on this week. And then we're working to with our service providers to figure out a way to remove these CPE challenges. And we re recognize how difficult it is for these CPE vendors to deploy a software upgrade. Um, I think the largest supplier has equipment in over 300 PSAPs. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you know, accomplish that in weeks or even, you know, a couple of months of time. It, it takes much longer than that just for a software upgrade. Um, so, and, and we, like I said, we went back to the standard and, and we've got a, a, a testing process to validate that all this works. So, we're really going to ask for the help and support of the PSAPs with these the DMARC testing and landing calls on your CPE. What we're learning is that I can test it here in the lab and it works beautiful shows. I don't have CAD, so I don't even know if it can be pushed to CAD. And I go out to the PSAP and I test it. It doesn't work at all because some little features not clicked or some little buttons not on or something's not working. Um, so we fix that. Then we try and push the CAD and it doesn't work. Well, what's the problem? We'd have to talk to the CAD vendor. We have to talk to the CP vendor. We have to validate the next gen 911 is sending the location right. All of that work is what we're doing right now. Um, and then obviously, one of our key strategies is to get this cloud native CPE um, to be viable. So we have another alternative if we continue to run into these barriers. And we, we're not seeking a perfect solution. You know, five nines is availability is near perfect, but not exactly perfect. So don't think that we're sacrificing anything to make this work, but at the same time, we're not, we haven't set such a lofty goal that it's not achievable. And finding that balance is, is where we're at. We also are gonna do a soft launch. So any anybody that's wanting to do like PR and public messaging and all that, this is kind of one of those things where you don't really want to be, you know, there. How many of you saw that really old Timex commercial where an elephant steps on a watch and, and it was live and they picked the watch up and it was broken. They're like, well, that didn't work very good. Um, you know, remember the Timex takes a lick and it keeps on ticking. We don't want that. So we'll do a soft launch. We'll validate that everything's working. And then, then we know that this is a huge, huge milestone for California and for the PCEPs involved and the vendors involved and for the state um, and obviously the support of the governor's office and, and the governor and the work that's been done to get to this place and the legislature and everybody else. But we'll do soft launch first and then 
we'll figure out what public messaging looks like later. Um, that'll remove that complexity from the project. So um, those are the things we're working on now uh, to, to try and fix and overcome these barriers. All right. Um, and, and obviously, the 911 first responders are critical to this. We've established test windows. We're going to be coming out and, and using those windows. So hopefully um, um, everyone has got the word. The test windows are Tuesday to Thursday from 10 to 1. And on the day we do testing, we, we give you a call or a vendor will give you a call and say, hey, can we land some calls on your CPE? If you say no, fine, we'll reschedule. If you say yes, we'll put the calls in and we may ask you things like, what does the location look like? Does that look like what a normal call with wireless call would look like or a normal wireline call? Hey, can you transfer that over to CHP? And then we'll ask CHP the same thing. It's that kind of effort that we're going to need to do um, to make sure that every PSAP is ready and everything is, is configured properly. But I have a question from the previous slide. Go ahead, Rosa. Um, I know we've identified some possible possible barriers. Um, wondering if we identified any barriers for secondary PSAPs. So the big challenge with secondary PSAPs is you don't directly receive a call. So when we're doing our testing, um, the test numbers go into a primary first and then need to be transferred. So we have to remember that. Um, but we have not seen any other barriers other than the testing involves one more step that when we want to test a secondary, we, we send a call into a primary, primary transfers it to you. Um, besides that, everything is configured the same. You've got your own boundaries. You have your own um, URIs, which is basically the, uh, the unique name we use to identify you. We, we treat a secondary PSAP the exact same as any other PSAP in the state, same equipment, same resources, same focus. So we have not seen any barriers related to secondaries. Thank you. Okay. And then Leanne, I think you had a question. Um, yeah, I, I had a question on the testing. Um, I think that you guys have done a good job of rolling out that, hey, we're going to be testing from Tuesday through Thursday. If you need backfill, this is what we can do to help. But one of the things that um, just struck me was, hey, we're going to ask you, um, did this call go through? What did it look like? Hey, CHP, you know, what did it look like? It sounds like you have some sort of acceptance test plan. Is there some questions that you plan on asking? Can you get those out to the PSAP so they know what they may be asked so someone doesn't um, get nervous and not understand how to answer what you're looking for? Yes, uh, we do. And so I'm going to be at, well, we're tentatively planning to go to Tuolumne tomorrow. There's a lot going on in that part of the state right now. Um, but we're tentatively planning to go out there and do some tests. We have a script that we've written. We're going to vet that with those PSAPs in that area. It's kind of just a baseline. It's not a lot. It's not detailed. It's more functionality. Um, that'll be what because we're trying to minimize the impact on on the uh, on the on the call taker. So yes, once we get that document together, we can share that with you. We also have asked our um, uh, Atos, who's our main vendor, to kind of give us a recipe. You know, we want to make sure. You know, the analogy I use, we're, we're baking cookies and we want to make sure that when we put the cookies in the oven, they come out and they're good cookies and they're not, you know, defiled with, you know, walnuts and chocolate chip cookies, which is just a terrifying thing to me. Um, you know, they actually come out, the recipes vetted, validated, and you get the right thing that you expect when you're done. So we're having that meeting with them um, in conjunction with the data we're gathering from this testing that we're actually doing out in the field, we being Cal OES ourselves. So yes, long before uh, we come to Monterey and subject you to this, uh, we'll have this vetted sufficiently. Uh, it's these uh, well, earlier ones that are that are helping us uh, uh, make sure we've got it uh, dialed in. So um, so no raisins in the cookies might have been a better analogy there, bud. Yeah. but but okay, no, walnuts. No raisins but, either. No raisins. <laughs> They're chocolate chip cookies. They're not, there's no raisins in them. <laughs> um, but but no, I just do think that, you know, as all, a lot of other PSAPs are listening to this, they're going to be like, hey, you're going to take some test calls. If And I know sometimes when we send forms out, people get overwhelmed because they don't understand the speak. So that's really what I'm advocating for, for all, not just my agency. 
Yeah. And uh, I was uh, I gave a presentation at Nina talking about how challenging it is to coordinate a project of this scale and magnitude. And I said, no matter how much you do outreach, no matter how much messaging there is, there's always somebody that doesn't get the word. And I, I'm not making this up, and I hope she doesn't mind that I'm calling her out, but there was a county coordinator from California in the room who had not heard about our, it was the telematics uh, integration that we had done. And she raised her hand, was like, um, I'm from such and such in California, and this is the first I've heard of this project. And I'm like, well, there you go. There's the perfect example. We only have 58 county coordinators. They're very involved in what we do, and they were just busy and didn't engage with what the messaging was that we sent out and didn't know. We got them immediately plugged in and up to speed. So that's the kind of thing that's gonna happen. And we know that because you all are busy and you're not there hovering over your inbox waiting to read an email from Cal OES. Might even be the opposite. You may have a filter on your inbox or you don't read you know, emails from Cal OES. So, and we understand that. And that's, that's gonna have to be part of the messaging. Okay. Um, so we've gone over this slide. I'm not going to belabor this, but I left it in here because when we post this on our website, which I think is going to happen today or tomorrow, um, you'll have this slide on all the different testing that we're doing. Uh, we've talked through this a number of times, but there's, you know, our lab testing we've done. There's integrating and testing of CPE and then DMARC testing where you're testing next gen to connect to your PSAP and uh, functionality and, and go live and carrier and all that. Um, a lot of work has to go into making sure that this solution is vetted prior to you receiving your first uh, 911 call. So I'll leave that uh, in the slide deck for you to, to, to review. We, get, we got a lot of questions on where am I in the process? How are we doing? Um, we, we developed a dashboard and I'm happy to give a quick demo on the dashboard um, these links are on our website and the instructions are on our website. I'm going to try this. Let's see if it works live. And hopefully everybody can see my current browser is not supported. Well, it is Firefox, I think. Let's see. We'll see if it comes up here. No pressure. Yeah, it's not like everybody's watching. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this dashboard is built to give you a status of where we are in the state. Um, this is statewide. If you don't put anything over here in, 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 a, in the PSAP name, the stats default the statewide. And this is where I say we're over 80% installed. This is um, Autos installs after the region, so the region's installed, Autos is installed at 83% of the PSAPs. CPE upgrade, we're about 25% of our way through that. And, and in fairness to the CPE vendors, as we work through some of these challenges, we, we realize that we're trying to validate the right version of software to install. So all you have to do up here in this search window is just pick your PSAP name um, and I, I don't know, I, I can just choose one randomly. Um, I'll go to Tuolumne County Sheriff because that's where I'll be um, tomorrow. And when you pick that, the, the toggle boxes and everything change to that PSAP. You can put in more than one PSAP, you can put in 10, you can put in 20, and all the radio boxes and everything all update. And you know, you've got the link there to the training and, and we made this public um, it's, it's available to everybody. We stripped out all the information that was um, that we considered to be uh, confidential. So this tool is available to to those that need it. All right. And any feedback on the tool? I know it's been out there since the last advisory board. I want to see if anybody has any feedback for us on it. Okay. This is the date slide I was talking about. Every time I put dates up here, my team freaks out. Like, you know, are we going to meet those? Every time we show them, they change. But based on what we know today, these are what we think could be realistic dates if we overcome the barriers that we know exist today. Uh, we, we could go live in September, maybe October, with our first group of PSAPs. 
Um, we know that November and December are challenging months for uh, everybody to do a lot of work in the Peace app. So I put January for that next phase and then February, March. Once we get going and get uh, stable on, on what we know is the solution, all the rest of the dates become much more firm and we could give you a much more definitive timeline. But until then, these are all just estimated. They're, they're dependent on five or six factors that are outside of, of our direct control, but we're working together uh, to, to overcome that. So that's what we're thinking uh, today. Any questions on that? And Leanne, I think this goes to your question. It does, thank you very much. Okay. All right, moving on. That's it on NextGen. The last thing I'm gonna mention is uh, our location accuracy project and what does NextGen have to do with text to 911 and the transition? So one thing we wanna make clear is that all over the top text solutions, so if you're using ComTech today through a web browser, you will be migrated over to Rapid Deploy through their interface. And we will definitely begin that in November, and we might even start as soon as, as October if the testing goes extremely well, but certainly by November. So if you are a ComTech user and your, your team is not using Rapid Deploy today, you need to, because it will dramatically shorten our training timeline for you uh, to get over the top, because Rapid Deploy is, is who we're contract, have a contract with to do over the top text. Well, it's with Atos who subcontracted to Rapid Deploy. Um, and we have this solution available to everybody. Many of you are using it for location accuracy through their Radius Plus product. Um, there's an SMS text capability, meaning you can text from 911. And we also rolled out OnStar and uh, integrated telematics into the solution. And I think there's been close to 300 um, different incidents of crash data being sent to PSAPs and some really good news story. Instead of having to relay all that information manually, manually over a phone line, it automatically populates on the rap, rapid deploy screen um, and, and you directly see the uh, crash data from OnStar and that's available now today. If you have any questions or if you're that top bullet applies to you and you're not using rapid deploy today, reach out to Mel Bland. We had them create an inbox that was um, easy to remember, OTT, over the top, if you're wondering what OTT stands for, uh, at rapiddeploy.com. That'll get you directly into them, and they can get you uh, up and running on this solution. It's a really important part of our strategy for, uh, for everybody to be ready to use this product um, and this solution for over-the-top text. So any questions on that? All right, almost done. Um, this is uh, our updated fund condition statement. Um, you'll see 2021-2022 uh, is on there. And the good news is um, if, you, if you've been around the advisor board for longer than two or three years, maybe you can see my cursor down here, but these, these positive numbers at the end of the year, uh, they were all negative when, when you know, four years ago until we got the uh, Setna fund restructured based on a flat rate on access lines. So the, the bottom line is we're healthy. We have the funding we need to accomplish the project. Uh, we've got the resources. We are putting in some requests to get some additional resource um, allocations for our GIS team and, and to do that work. But, but we have the, the funding that we need to do this and we are gathering the number of access lines right now, uh, which is the next slide. Um, so that we can set the fee for a uh, calendar year 2022. We anticipate it being very similar to the one that's in place now. Uh, the 30 cent mark, we wouldn't see, uh, you know, any significant change to that and maybe no change. Uh, we're still crunching those numbers. They are due to the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration by October 1st. So by the next time we meet, um, I'll have these solid numbers for you based on our current fiscal year. These are what we set um, last year. So any question on the health of Setna or on, on the funding that we've got available or any other funding sources?
Okay, thank you very much, Budge. Any uh, questions, any further questions of Budge? Then we will move on to the Long Range Planning Committee report out. Is that uh, Chris Heron or somebody else? That's still me, Pat. Can't get away from us, can you? That's right. That's right. <laughs> That is right. We talked about that yesterday, but uh, good morning, everyone. Um, since the last advisory board meeting, the LRPC met uh, just once. That was yesterday's meeting. Um, and so just a few updates for you. We received the 911 uh, branch strategic plan, and uh, that is a document that is available on the website. And Budge, you just confirmed that was sent to the advisory board members as well, correct? Um. Yes, it was sent to the advisory board members and it is on our website. Apologies, I thought that was mentioned yesterday, but so you should have all received that um, <clears throat> via email. It's also on the website. Uh, we discussed that, provided some feedback from our members. Um, our members have been directed to provide any additional feedback to the state in writing. It's by the end of September. Uh, we then plan to review a final draft of that document at our October meeting. And the intent is to have um, have that ready, the state will have that ready for you at the November advisory board meeting. Um, our regional working groups met this summer and received updates from the next gen 911 vendors, including the project overview, as well as our migration plan that included a discussion about training and as well as what the service and maintenance of the new network will look like. Additionally, our GIS working group met um, for their meeting, they had an open uh, an open forum uh, where they discussed uh, lessons learned so far in getting their GIS data um, up to NINA standards, if you will. And that forum included a PSAP that did the work in-house with in-house staff, a PSAP that used a third party vendor to do the work, and then also uh, one of the vendors sharing their perspective. Uh, last group to report to us was the county coordinators task force the cctf as they're known uh, it's been resurrected so to speak um, after being dormant for a bit uh, at least as it as it relates to the state um, they've they've now assigned uh, coordinators for each of the regions that match the next gen regions that were created so there's um, cctf coordinators for the north the central the south and la um, they had some discussions about the role of the county coordinators in the next gen environment and wanted to share that it's been identified that during the transition to next gen, um, there actually will be a heavier workload on those county coordinators because they're gonna have to um, maintain and keep up the databases, both for the legacy and next gen networks until the, the full transition. Uh, that is the end of the report from yesterday. I think the next item, you guys can tell me. Do you want me to go ahead and introduce that, uh, Budge or Paul, or did you want to speak to it first, item seven? So, Pat, I don't know if you want to get any feedback or questions from the board oh. members on this item first. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Chris. <laughs> so, uh, so there, are there any questions of the Long Beach Planning Committee before we move to item seven? See, I, I foresaw that. Well, you answered everything very well. Thank you. Okay, let's move to item number seven. Budge, I'm gonna let you take this. Yeah, so, um, you know, Chris um, has, has been serving as the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee uh, for some time. And we looked at the charter and what the charter says is that um, ad advisory board members are to review and assign Long Range Planning Committee members. And with the new members that we have on the board we want to put this as an agenda item we can certainly put it on the agenda again um, next time so you have more time to think about it um, you know there's no requirement to replace who your corresponding long-range planning committee member is or the person serving there but the opportunity is there and that that's the way the charter is written um, even to replace the chair. No offense, Chris, you're doing a great job and I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make any comments there, but this agenda item is here for that reason, um, just so that you all know the process. Um, and then Chris, you wanna cover the various agencies that are represented and, and the vacancies um, as per the charter. I think that would be helpful. If I could, please, uh, yeah. And so, I think just that as a reminder, what Budge just said, the, our charter calls for the makeup 
uh, of the group to be rep a representative from each organization that's on the advisory board. And so our current makeup, um, I'm serving as the chair. I work for North County Dispatch JPA in San Diego, and I'm representing the Fire Chiefs Association. And we have Jody Pat, who works for the city of Escondido, representing police chiefs. Uh, Leanne Magoski, who works for the uh, Monterey County, and Rosa Ramos, who works for Alameda County, are both the Calmina reps. Desi Calzada, who's from Stanislaw Regional 911, uh, is the APCO rep. And then Alicia Fuller from CHP, representing CHP, um, is our final member. We don't currently have a CSSA rep, um, so certainly that is open. And then the charter does allow flexibility. So if there are organizations that want a second rep or what we've done at times to help with succession planning, it's always nice to have a little bit of overlap so that it's not just one person's here today and gone tomorrow. So we, the charter does allow us to have two members from an organization. And I think it's especially helpful in that regard. So um, I know for me personally, I've, I reached out to the uh, two new CFCA reps and I'd certainly encourage all of the advisory board members to be in contact with your LRPC reps if you're not already. Um, and then you can communicate back to the state if any new nominations or changes are desired. Budge, I just recommend um, we could do two things. One is I could send the, the current roster um, to you and the charter and, and then for distribution out to the advisory board members, unless there's other questions or comments. I do have a question. I, I may have missed what the commitment is for um, that particular committee. If that could be included in the, the materials, that would be really helpful. Some of us have some pretty impacted schedules. Thanks. I'll include that. And actually, maybe it's probably fair to answer here so everyone knows. We typically, we meet the day prior to all the advisory board meetings, so four meetings, and then we have two um, off month meetings um, that are typically one in the spring, one in the fall. The last couple of years, we've done those in April and October. So six meetings per year. Now, you know, the last 18 months, these have been remote. So the commitment's been fairly easy. Typically, though, these are public meetings that are held in Sacramento. So. And Sheriff, if you want to get a sense of um sort of the, the view that this long range planning committee has, that strategic plan that we sent out, those are the exact things that we talk about. So that'll give you a good sense of kind of what is the conversation like. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we started to get a lot more specific on operational questions, which we certainly can answer, but we've, we've moved away into more of this long range planning. So it's not that we don't, we cannot address operational issues because we do day to day stuff. and. You know, as Chris, as the chair brings it up, we certainly answer those um, questions, but it's more strategic in nature and that strategic plan really highlights kind of what this group is trying to do. And we view them as a valuable resource um, to make sure that we're being compliant, not only with our statutory requirements, which we think are, are very clear, but also the operational needs of the PSAP and that we were keeping in mind basically our customers, you know, uh, who we're serving. Um, as we develop our long range plans um, and and move 911 and, and all of all of the other um, technologies that are in the PSAP forward. And that's really what this group is about. OK, well, I think, uh, Chris, you, you raised a good point. If you can send out a list of that stuff and and, uh, you know, some of the supporting documentation, uh, we'll make sure that we get it out to all the board members. And thank you for your question, Sheriff Ayub, uh, spot on. Okay, let's move on to the next item, which is the strategic initiatives and budgets back to you again. Yes, we, we've mentioned, Chris mentioned this at the meeting, um, you know, we're not going to, um, I'm not gonna go through this in detail today, but I am um, really asking for feedback from the board members uh, we've, we're giving you over a month to do this because we realize that it's, you know, it, it, it's going to take some time. I want to say the document's less than 10 pages long. It's about eight pages. So it's not a long document. Um, and what we do is we list the mission of, of the 911 branch. This is, this is from our perspective, but we need your input. And then we've identified three high-level goals. And then within the document, you'll see 
each goal has a number of objectives. And then each objective has a number of strategies that are used to achieve the objective. And then the, the bottom portion of the strategic plan lists the metrics that are used to measure the effectiveness of how well we are doing in achieving the goal. So you'll see a goal and then a metric and a, a number of metrics under it. So there's a measurement of how are we doing, that's the, met the metrics, and then everything aligns. It's on our website, um, so it's a Word document. And if you have any feedback at all, we're asking you to email those responses back to Sophia. She'll coordinate all the data. We'll meet with the Long Range Planning Committee. We'll adjudicate all those responses. We'll come back to the advisory board in November with their recommendations on, on what they think should be in that plan. Uh, and hopefully we'll finalize that plan at the November 17th advisory board. Um, it might be a little cumbersome to go through this publicly, but we're certainly willing to do that. We'll figure out a way to facilitate that. I've served on a number of um, uh, strike forces and, and at the FCC level and, and you know large groups. So we'll figure out a way to, to share those comments and we'll really probably bring up the, the areas that the Long Range Planning Committee identifies that where there may be um, a need for a, a collaborative voice on. But generally, uh, the way we'll present that at the advisor board is here's the points that we want to get additional clarity on and we'll finalize the document. Okay, thank you, Budge. Um, any questions from the board on this? All right, let's move on to agenda item number nine, which is uh, future meetings. Um, next meeting, as Budge said, was November 17th, and uh, we do have the meetings for 2022 shown here. Um, are there any items that the board would, would like to see on the agenda for the November 17th meeting? Um, Pat, and I'm sure um, Budge is going to have this ongoing, but just that update of if there are any um, PSAPs that are having problems with their CPE or, you know, what's going on or as the, I forget the new gal's name, but as she gets implemented, the realistic ability to implement um, as we switch over to cloud and what's going on with the CPE in the meantime. Okay. Budge, copy? Solid copy. We'll make sure it's on there. Okay, any other uh, comments or any other items that the board would like to see on the next agenda? Going once, going twice. Okay, next item is a public comment. So the floor is open. If you would be so kind as to raise your hand, then we will call on you for uh, you, to pose your question. Any questions? All right, let's move to agenda item number 11, which is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Leanne will make the motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn by Leanne Magoski. Do we have a second? Rosa will second. I'm sorry, who was that? Rosa. Rosa, okay, thank you, Rosa Ramos. Um, without objection, we will stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate your participation. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.